you want to hear about play at a party or whatever. Bring back exciting memories of how much fun this was to you a couple semesters ago. Yeah. Okay, did you get this basic connectivity for the second one? So far, now we have to put in our electrons. And so I've seen a couple different possibilities. I saw some people had something like this, and some people had something like this. First of all, are either of those correct as written? Not quite. What are they missing? Well, that, but what else? Just in a drawing standpoint. What haven't we put in here yet? Formal charges, right? So those structures are not complete until formal charges are there. Where should the formal charge go on the structure on the left? On the carbon, right. The carbon will have a positive formal charge. And what about on the right? What's the relationship between those two structures? Well, we don't have enough electrons to do that in the structure. Uh, well, they're very similar, right? How do they differ? Yeah. Right. They have the same number of electrons, but in the one on the left, the electrons are on the oxygen. And the one on the right, it's almost as though those electrons have come down to form a bond. And in this class, actually, we account for electrons very closely. And so we actually draw these little arrows, which we'll talk about over the next couple days, where we could say those electrons actually come down here to form this bond. And that's not a reaction, but we draw a double-sided arrow. We could similarly say, on this case, the electrons come from the bond and go back on the oxygen. And those are known as resonance forms. And we'll talk about that in a little more detail in a few minutes. But that's an example of resonance. Now, one of these resonance forms is much more important than the other, meaning that one of them is much more stable than the other. Which one is the more important one? Satisfying the octet rule. Satisfying the octet rule, right. So the one on the left. The carbon violates the octet rule, has less than an octet. And as we'll learn in this class, that's actually not so much of a hard and fast rule anymore. Um, so, sorry. But <laughs> we, will, we will sometimes have carbons with less than an octet. However, that is a much less stable environment. So having the structure on the right, where all the atoms do have the octet, and the formal charges on oxygen, is a better, a better structure, or what we would say is a stronger resonance contributor better structure there. OK. And what about the last one? 
there are actually several ways you could do this one. This is a quiz question? Last year. Yeah, it's always a quiz question. It probably will be this year, too, or something like it. It always comes, seems to come up. Uh, so you have this basic connectivity, and then you have to fulfill your numbers of electrons. So what kind of stuff did you put in? Somebody give me one that you got here. How did you arrange your electrons? OK, and then what about uh, lone pairs? Five electrons? Okay. And is that enough electrons? Not quite, right? Because it's SCN minus, so you've got six from sulfur, four from carbon, that's ten, five from nitrogen is fifteen, and then one more because it's SCN minus, so that's sixteen. Where do you want to put that extra electron? Probably on sulfur, right? So it has an octet. OK, so that's one. Did anybody put in something different? What did you? What did you uh... OK, so you have this. Like that? What about formal charges? Where would formal charges be on the first one? On the sulfur. Sulfur will have a negative formal charge here. And over on the right, uh, sulfur will be 0, carbon will be 0, and nitrogen will be negative 1. Okay. I realize I'm going through this a little bit quickly. Uh, I do want you to have some good facility with formal charges. So if this is something that you're not quite getting why that's doing that, make sure you get to some of those practice problems um, so you get it. So this one is not quite as obvious which is a better resonance form. These, again, are resonance forms because they only differ by placement of electrons and not by uh, connectivity. <laughs> but it's not quite as obvious which one's better because they all satisfy the octet rule. So if you had to pick, which one would you pick is better? How many people say the one on the left? That's this one, for those of you who know. Um, OK, how many would say the one on the right is better? OK, so it looks like we've got a few more for the right. I guess the right takes it then. Is that how science works? We just vote, and then whichever yeah. one yeah. most people believe, that's the, that's the right. Well, OK, so, so somebody, what was your rationale for your answer? Anybody, either answer. You said two double bonds is better. Why? You like the symmetry of it? I like the symmetry of it. Plus, it's like the bonds are the same. Or is it like if you have like one triple bond, those are going to be close, and one single bond, single bond, all of the Okay. So, so it sort of spreads the bond energy out around the molecule? Right. It's just more symmetrical. Okay. Yeah. What else? Yeah. Isn't the first one because uh, it's a triple bond and it's hard to break it? Hard to break the triple bond? Sure. Maybe. That's a good idea. Nitrogen maybe has a tendency to form triple bonds. Well, certainly, like in N2, we see nitrogen triple bonds. The second one, because nitrogen is more electronegative and prefers a formal charge in the negative. Okay. So uh, a negative charge is better stabilized on an electronegative atom. All right. Yeah, these are all, um, all good reasons, all good ways to think about it. There's actually one that it's, that's a better one that, that you guys said, and that's the last one. So the, 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 this fact that the electronegativity makes this a slightly better resonance form is actually true. So let's look if, to remind ourselves again before we get too far into that. Here's our electronegativity table. Whoa, no. Where'd it go? All right, let's get back there again. There's our electronegativity table. All right. So we're increasing electronegativity to the right and up. Um, and a more electronegative element is more able to stabilize a negative charge. And that makes this one a little bit better.
The more electronegative element better stabilizes the negative charge. So that's a little bit better of a resonance contributor. Um, if you were to draw arrows, those little electron arrows again, this is what they would look like here. You'd go down from the sulfur and make a double bond between the sulfur and carbon. And then you'd take one of these and you'd put it back up on the nitrogen and that gets you to here. Do you see how that works? This arrow tells you that these two electrons go down into this bond, which was here. And then this bond comes up and becomes a lone pair on the nitrogen. All right, good. So let's review one more aspect while we're talking about electronegativity. Let's talk about polarity and dipole moments. How do we determine if a bond is polar? Just a bond, one single bond. You're right with molecule, we'll get to that in a second. But how do we determine if just one bond is polar? Electronegativity, what do, what do we do with that? Right. If there's a difference in electronegativity, we call that a polar bond. And about how big of a difference is there supposed to be? Can you remember the number? 0.5 or greater. About 0.5, yeah. And that's, I mean, that's just kind of a convention, but yeah, essentially if there's a difference between about 0.5, you call that a polar bond. So a CN bond is polar, but a CH bond is not. What just mean is that flashing? Okay, that must be annoying for you guys. Yeah. All right, I'll have to call him about that. Um, yeah, so, so that's polar versus nonpolar. Uh, in this class, we don't actually deal with that many elements compared to what we did in, in Gen Chem, right? We're mostly focused on H, C, N, O. That's the organic stuff, the, the chemistry of life. So it, once you know which bonds are polar and which aren't, you're pretty much good, right? CO bonds are polar, CN bonds, uh, NO bonds, CH bonds are nonpolar. Uh, CS bonds are nonpolar. CCL bonds are uh, sort of pretty on the on the line, right? It's 0.5, so they're sort of polar. Um, so now let's apply that to whole molecules. Let's look at carbon dioxide. There's our Lewis structure for carbon dioxide. Is that molecule polar overall? Why not? CO, if CO bonds are polar, why isn't carbon dioxide polar? That's right. They cancel each other out. So what you do is you take your, your individual dipole moments from the bonds, and you add them together. So here's one this way. Here's one. You add those two together, and you get zero overall cancel each other out. So carbon dioxide is not polar. What about if we go back up here? What about SCN? Thiocyanate. Is that polar? They cancel each other out again? What do you think? It's polar. Why? That's right. Uh, nitrogen is more electronegative than sulfur, so it's more pulled that way. So the overall dipole moment goes to the right uh, toward nitrogen. We also say that that leads to some partial separation of charge within the molecule. And that's true even for overall nonpolar molecules. But what we might say is that because of these dipoles, there's a partial positive charge on the carbon, partial negative charges on the others. So the partial charge is kind of the counterpart to the uh, formal charge. A formal charge means there's extra electrons on this atom, and it has this formal charge. A partial charge means every, there isn't a full charge. The electrons haven't moved around, but they've sort of shifted a bit, and that leads to a partial separation of charge. And you can't really see that. It's a lowercase delta, uh, Greek letter delta, plus or delta minus. I can do it up on this one. So then we see that as well now, is that there's going to be a partial minus here, partial positive here. 
Um, and then the sulfur, actually, carbon sulfur, have about the same electronegativity, so those aren't really polar. OK, so now let's look at a larger organic molecule and um, try to figure out what this kind of polarity means. And we'll talk about the shapes of these molecules in a bit. Now you see here um, carbons and some hydrogens, and then with a carbon double bond oxygen, which is known as a ketone. Uh, and then over on the right, you have a carbon bound to chlorine. So what can you say about polarity in this molecule? Let's start with this. Do you think it's useful to tell to say that this molecule is overall polar or nonpolar in this case? Not really, because it's so big. It clearly has like some polar parts and some nonpolar parts. And to say that the whole thing is polar or nonpolar is probably not really helpful to us. Um, for instance, it has this chain of carbons and hydrogens in the middle. That's a pretty nonpolar area, right? And then it has a carbon oxygen bond, which we know is pretty polar, and a carbon chlorine bond, which is a little bit polar. Uh, so it's better to, I think, think about these things as having regions of these different types of uh, electronic arrangements than to say overall this molecule is polar or nonpolar. So, yeah, and sometimes that's really important. Um, for instance, quick aside. Uh, fatty acids are molecules that look like this. Well, after their hydrogen is taken off, they have this really, really long carbon chain, and then they have a uh, called a carboxylate on the end, a region of, of carbon and oxygen. And when you take that hydrogen off, and you have these things all assembled together, they make these things called micelles, where all of the uh, nonpolar parts come into the center of a big sphere, and then the polar parts are on the outside. And that allows them to dissolve in water, because the water can go around the polar part on the outside, and the nonpolar part is stuck on the inside. Well, why is that useful? Other nonpolar stuff can also get stuck on the inside here. And so these are soaps, and this is how soap works. The soap, the nonpolar part of the soap molecule, comes in the inside and interacts with grease and dirt and other nonpolar stuff. And then the uh, polar part goes on the outside so it can be dissolved in water. So oil won't dissolve in water on its own but when you put in a soap or a detergent, then it will. And so in large molecules like that, it's really important that they actually have those two parts. Uh, just having one or the other wouldn't have it, let it have that effect. And there are a lot of cases where that's true. So back to this molecule then. Based on what you know, um, where, do you, where would you see charge separation, or where would you expect to see charge separation in this molecule? The double bond O, and how would, you, how would the charge separation work out? Yeah. I think. Right. Yeah, oxygen's more electronegative than carbon, so it pulls some electron density over to it, leaving some electron space on the carbon or some positive charge there. What else? The carbon chlorine, and how would that work out? Same thing, basically. You'd have a partial negative on the chlorine and a partial positive on the carbon. Now, what you've just done, actually, is identified where the chemistry is going to take place on this organic molecule. So if, you, if I said, all right, um, I have this other molecule, this bromide ion, a negatively charged bromide ion, and that ion is going to attack this molecule somewhere, where would you expect it to attack that molecule? Well, think about it. The bromine is negatively charged. So where is that most attracted to? The, po the areas of positive charge. So we would, we would expect that this bromine could maybe come in over here or maybe over here, those two regions of positive charge. And in fact, that's true. right? And these are the kind of decisions you're going to be making all semester. Where does this thing attack? Where does this thing go? And you're going to use things like polarity to figure that out. 
because negative and, char negative and positive attract each other, and so the bromine would expect to go over to those more positive areas. Um, so this is some, some you know, simple gen chem stuff, but it's going to apply to everything that we do. And, and so it's going to keep coming up again and again in that way. So you have any questions about that? All right, let's move on to a different topic. Orbitals. So first, orbitals in organic chemistry easier than orbitals in general chemistry. Why? Because we don't deal with d orbitals. So we don't have to worry about those. Or f orbitals. I mean, you would eventually, but not so much in this class. So remind me, what are orbitals? General areas where electrons can be found. Yeah. And uh, what sorts of orbitals are there? S, P, D, F, okay. Uh, what do they look like? What's an S orbital look like? Cl close. Sphere, right? It's a three-dimensional space. So yeah, it's approximately a sphere. What does a P orbital look like? A dumbbell, two kind of lobes, two balloons stuck together. Um, so something like... Right. So you got one S orbital, and then you've got three P orbitals along each axis. And then uh, we don't care, because the rest is not organic chemistry. It is, but we're not going to mess with it so much. Uh, but but we're, we are going to deal with S and P orbitals pretty extensively, and how they what happens when S and P orbitals mix together? They hybridize, right? You get hybrid orbitals. What kind of hybrid orbitals are there? SP, SP2, SP3. Yeah, we don't care about those. But yeah, you're right. Yeah, they can hybridize with d-orbitals, too. We won't deal with that in this class. Um, so we care about sp and then sp, sp2, and sp3. So let's practice that a little bit. Um, let's, let's look at the same molecule. All right, what is the hybridization of that carbon right there? And how do you know? SP3, how do you know? Uh, okay, close. H, well, hydrogen doesn't actually have filled p orbitals, but I think you're on the right track. This carbon is going to be tetrahedral. It's connected to four other things, right? Let's draw that out. We're only worried about the central atom. Now, again, with organic molecules, we look at large animal, large animals, large molecules. So it's not so much the central atom, but the atoms that have other things connected to them throughout the molecule. So this carbon has four things connected to it, and for those four things to all be appropriately spread apart as wide as possible, that gives it a tetrahedral geometry, which tells us that it is uh, sp3 hybridized. Okay, bond angle is about 110, or maybe a little less. Okay, what about this one up here? How do you know that one's sp2? Okay, how do you know that? Yeah, you've got three things connected, so for those three things to be spread apart, that's going to take up a trigonal plane, 120 degree bond angles, uh, that's sp2 hybridization. What about the next carbon? Yep, that's going to be sp3 again. Those 
because I'll have four things connected. Whoops. Let me get that on yet. So what about this last one? It's got that chlorine in there. Does that change anything? So what is the hybridization of that? That's going to be sp3 also. It still has four things attached. Two hydrogens, then this carbon, then this chlorine. So when we deal with hybridization in this class, it'll be less about like looking at this whole molecule, looking at the central one and figuring it out. It'll be more about looking at a big molecule and looking at individual atoms um, to see. So let's take, uh, let's zoom in a little bit on this carbon double bond oxygen and see what's going on with the bonding there. So uh, if we look at it from the side, let's say it looks like CO, let me see it bigger. Then coming off of the carbon, it's trigonal planar, and you've got the carbon here on one side and the other carbon on the other side, something like that. So how would we draw those orbitals out? What, uh, what types of orbitals go where in this diagram? Maybe you haven't seen these before. That, that's OK. Uh, let me get you started here. So the carbon is sp2 hybridized. What does that tell you about the types of orbitals that it has on it, the types of atomic orbitals that are on it? How many sp2 hybrid orbitals are on there? I'm just going to keep naming numbers until I say it's right. Yeah. Well, it, it actually tells you right in the name. Okay, well that's why we're talking about it now. That's fine. Yeah, you you can't destroy orbitals, right? You can't make them just go away. So if they hybridize, then you have you have to end up with the same number of hybrid orbitals as you started with atomic orbitals, uh, unhybridized orbitals. So if you hybridize an S and two Ps to make an sp2 hybrid orbital, how many hybrid orbitals do you end up with? Three, right? You guys get that? You start with an S and two Ps. You hybridize those together. You end up with three hybrid orbitals. Um, so let me. It um, sort of, yeah. We'll get to that in a second. I think I can find it here. I'm trying to find a particular picture. Whatever, I'll draw it. So you, uh, what does a hybrid orbital look like? Anybody remember? Well, you can sort of figure it out. Remember we said that this is an s orbital, right? And we said, let's do it this way. And we said this is a p orbital. It has these different phases. Um, so if an s and a p orbital hybridize, you have constructive interference on one side and destructive interference on the other side. So that's what a hybrid or orbital looks like. One side gets big, one side gets little. Okay. Let's see if I can get a nice picture from the book here. Come on, where's a nice hybrid? There we go. There. All right. So that's kind of a hybrid orbital. Bigger on one side, smaller on the other side because of that interference. So we can draw that. Um, and this carbon is going to have one hybrid orbital pointing out toward the oxygen, another one pointing out toward this carbon, and then another one pointing out toward this carbon. And that's going to be in a trigonal planar arrangement. They should all be the same size, but I was trying to kind of show perspective or something. If you looked at it from above, right, it kind of looks like this. A little something like that. 
120 degree angles around. All right, then what kind of orbital is left over on that carbon? If you hybridized an S with two P's, what's left? The third P, right, because you got three of them. So where does that go? Yeah, that stays right on that carbon, unhybridized, regular P orbital. Okay, and that's a, that's a picture of sp2 hybridization. So now over on the oxygen, the hybridization idea doesn't work quite as well because the oxygen isn't bound to other stuff. But if we say that the electrons are in those orbitals, we can say that the oxygen also has one hybrid orbital pointing at the carbon. Those are the bond. That's the bond. And then it has another one that has a lone pair in it. And another one over here with a lone pair in it. And then it also has a p orbital. So here are your three sp2 hybrid orbitals. And there's a p orbital. And the same thing on the oxygen. So then how do these things bond together? And how does that describe what we see in the structure up there, in the Lewis structure? What types of orbitals are combining to form bonds here? The two Ps and, and these two hybrid orbitals that are pointing at each other. So these two connect. And what, whoops. And what type of a bond is that? Anybody remember the two types of bonds that we talked about? Sigma, right. So that's a sigma bond. And then the two p orbitals also mix. And that forms a pi bond. Somebody remind me what a sigma bond is and what a pi bond is. What? Not exactly. Not exactly. It's true that a double bond has a sigma bond and a pi bond. But what's the difference between those two? Yeah, kind of how they line up. In a sigma bond, and remember, any two orbitals can sigma bond. In a sigma bond, two orbitals come together. So let's use hybrid orbitals as our example, since that's what we're talking about. This orbital and this orbital, their phases line up. They can bond, and the bond that they form looks like those things kind of mash together. Okay, so we'll call that an sp2 and an sp2. And this is a sigma bond made of two sp2 orbitals. So in a sigma bond, two lobes kind of mush together, or two orbitals mush together to form the bond in the middle. In a pi bond, two orbitals are kind of side by side. So there's two p orbitals. And then they form something that kind of looks like this. So that the tops and the bottoms have mushed together, but they've left a spot in the middle called a node where there aren't electrons. Okay. And that's how you pick out the pi bond. So the pi bond has this node in the middle where you've got mushing above and below, but not through the middle. And the sigma bond has the mushing together that goes all the way through and is continuous. All right. So this one we would call a pi pp bond, a pi made of two p orbitals. You can also have a sigma bond made of p orbitals when the p orbitals are laying on their sides and mushing together that way. All 
All right. Do you want to see? Oh, okay. So that's that's hybridization. Um, please go through and look at that a little bit. Like I said, we won't be quite as in depth as we were in in Gen Chem, but it is important to know the shapes of these things and how they come together. Uh, luckily, we can ignore the d orbitals. But take a look at that. Uh, there isn't a whole lot of stuff to get. It's just a matter of practicing it, kind of getting used to the, looking for those things. All right, next part then. This is not the whole story, when two orbitals bond. They don't just sort of mush together and form a bond. What do they form? Do you remember this? They, if two atomic orbitals come together, they actually form two types of bonds, or two types of molecular orbitals. What are those called? Anybody remember? If one's, a, if one's a sigma or a pi, what's the other one? Sigma star, pi star, antibonding orbitals? Is that ring bell at all? No? Maybe a little? No? OK. All right. Um, you guys can do that? Um, all right. Well, yeah. Yeah, we'll, we'll, we'll get into that too. Well, we don't need to get too much into it here because organic chemistry, but we will, we will use these. So there's this theory that explains a lot of bonding that we call molecular orbital theory. So that what we've been talking about with hybridization is called valence bond theory. Valence bond theory works well for a number of molecules, but it doesn't explain some things. And molecular orbital theory is a little bit more general theory that kind of explains the things where valence bond theory fails. Valence bond theory is a localized version of bonding, which means you look at each atom, you look at its orbitals, and then you say these orbitals combine with the orbitals next to it, and that forms the bond. Um, that's what I mean by localized, each individual atom. Molecular orbital theory says, no, no, you take all the atomic orbitals from all the atoms in the molecule, you put them all together in a big bucket, and then you create new molecular orbitals, which are orbitals for the whole molecule to have instead of the individual atom. And, you know, it's a whole topic unto itself, and if you go on and take um, inorganic chemistry and physical chemistry, you'll get into this in great detail. But for our purposes, what you need to know is that when two s orbitals combine, let's say two hydrogen atoms, they actually form two molecular orbitals. One that's in phase, that is lower in energy, that's called the bonding orbital, and that would be the sigma orbital. And that's known as bonding. And then one higher in energy, where they're out of phase, sort of like repelling each other. And that's known as the sigma star orbital, or which is described as antibonding. That's right. So then you, you make these MO diagrams, and you fill them with electrons, and you can determine whether or not uh, the bonds are likely to form. If electrons fill bonding orbitals, that means the electrons are getting lower in energy, so the molecule is stable. If electrons fill antibonding orbitals, they're, getting, they're going up in energy, and the molecule is less stable. The way we use this in um, organic chemistry is we look at a molecule, and we know that the antibonding orbitals are the empty ones, the ones where there is um, space for electrons to come in. So when two molecules react with each other, the electrons from one molecule are going into the antibonding orbital of another molecule, and that's how they're starting to form these connections. And when we get into uh, some reactions, we'll get into this a little bit more detail, and it'll probably make a little bit more sense, because we'll have some, some real examples to look at there. So, you take a look at that. Um, what other things do we need to review here? Uh, 
dipoles and polarity. We did that. Okay, let's talk about intermolecular forces with our last little time here. And then we'll get into resonance next week. This you've talked about before, right? So somebody can name an intermolecular force. Dipole, dipole. Good. What else? What? Ion, ion. Again, one we don't have to care about here because organic chemistry. No. Well, I guess a little bit. That's not totally true. There are some ions. What else? What? Yeah, Van der Waals forces. That one's important here. What are all those also known as? Yeah, dispersion forces or London forces. Um, what do they say in the book? In this book, does this book go with? They go with London. Okay. Um, yeah, London dispersion forces. Okay. And hydrogen bonding. That pretty much takes care of it, right? Minus some little ion dipole and whatever else here. Okay, these will all be very, very important in this class. Um, let's look at a, lo uh, a large organic molecule like hexane. What are the major intermolecular forces in hexane? Those are going to be your, what do you say, Lon dispersion forces, London forces? Yeah. Why? How do you know? What? Well, they're always in everything, sure, but they're predominant here. Well, it, that's part of it. What else? It's kind of the absence of other forces. Um, so the, the strongest or the most important forces in hexane are the um, dispersion forces because what do all these other types of forces require? Polarity. And we don't have any polarity in hexane. Right? It's totally nonpolar. So that means that we can't have things like hydrogen bonding. We can't have things like dipole forces, and it's certainly not an ion, so we're not going to have ion forces either. Um, hexane is a liquid. Anybody ever used hexane before? Yeah. You use it as solvent or um, uh, like a stove fuel. Like, do you get one of those camping stoves? It's a liquid. It's, it's a solvent. It's very volatile. Right? It evaporates quickly. It smells bad. You shouldn't smell it because it'll give you cancer. But um, <laughs> it'll smell it. I mean, eventually. Yeah. Uh, but it has a pretty high molecular weight compared to something like water, and yet it's far more volatile, much higher vapor pressure. And that's because the dispersion forces are so much weaker um, than, than the hydrogen bonding. What do you need for hydrogen bonding? Who remembers that? Yeah. That's right. Hydrogen bonding only happens when hydrogen is connected to either nitrogen, oxygen, or fluorine. Why is that? Because they're the most electronegative, so that, that'll give you that large difference in electronegativity that you need um, to have hydrogen bonding, which is really just a special type of dipole-dipole forces, a special, especially strong type of dipole-dipole forces. Um, all right, so let's look now at some trends. And I think we've probably seen these before. Going too far. Oh, that's the dipole stuff. Okay. Let's go to the dispersion forces. So here are the hydrocarbons. Okay. I don't know if you can read those numbers, but you start with methane, 
go up to ethane, propane, butane, pentane, all the way up to... Does that keep going up by one? So that's decane. Um, you know those names, by the way? Is that something you do in Gen Chem? We'll get back. We'll get into that later anyway. You can see the boiling point varies approximately linearly as you increase the um, carbon. And when you have the same sets of the same types of forces, that's approximately true. You also notice that the boiling point doesn't approach that of water until you get up to uh, heptane, which is seven, uh, seven carbons long. And that's a molecular weight of, what, about 80-something? Uh, whereas water has a molecular weight of 18. So you can see that without those strong hydrogen bonding, you need very, very large uh, areas, surface areas, to start to approach the same strength of forces. Okay. Now, one way that these are intermolecular forces are very important in organic chemistry is with solvents. The things we actually do the reaction in, the medium that we do the reaction in, is called a solvent, because most solids don't react very well together. And we can separate these into two categories and then a subcategory. Polar and nonpolar are going to be our two main first categories. So somebody give me some examples of uh, polar solvents, let's say. What's a polar solvent? Water, yeah. What else? Alcohol, or uh, we'll, what, 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 uh, you have a favorite alcohol, or? Propanol? OK. What else? Hmm? HCl, well, we've got to be a little careful there, because HCl is actually a gas. And only when it's dissolved in water does it become hydrochloric acid. So it's not really a solvent on itself. It's, it's sort of water. You know. It's because it's not a pure substance. But yeah, you can you could certainly use that. And what else? Any other polar solvents you know of? What? Benzene would be nonpolar. We'll put that down here. Uh, benzene, hexane. Um, acetic acid. That could go there. Yep, that could be that could be in, in a polar solvent. I want to show you some other common organic solvents that you probably haven't seen before. One is uh, this one. That's known as diethyl ether, or just ether. It's polar, but not terribly so. It's eh, borderline there. Acetone is another good one. Looks like this. That's a pretty polar solvent. On the nonpolar side, some other ones you might encounter besides these, these kind of standards. Um, carbon disulfide, CS2. Carbon tetrachloride, CCl4. There are some mildly polar solvents. Uh, the, other the other chlorocarbons, like chloroform, CHCl3, and dichloromethane or methylene chloride, CHCl2. We'll be using those for sure this semester. So then within this category of polar, there are two subcategories that you probably haven't heard before. And that is protic and aprotic. Any idea what those mean? Proton, yeah, it has to do with the proton. Um, so what do you think, based on that definition of these here, would you put one in one of those groups? 
what do you think might be an example of a polar protic solvent? Water is. That's right. Why? Yeah. So the definition of protic um, is that it can donate hydrogen. So essentially it can hydrogen bond. So protic solvents are things like water, alcohols, propanol, ethanol, methanol, um, certain amines, that's nitrogen compounds, uh, acetic acid certainly. And then aprotic solvents are polar solvents that cannot do that, like acetone. Acetone doesn't have any um, what we call acidic hydrogens or hydrogens that can come off, uh, labile hydrogens. Neither do, uh, do these, other, other, these other ones that I put up there. So we're going to encounter situations where we want or don't, we want either want protic or we want to avoid protic solvents because how those hydrogens can interact with our molecules that we care about um, in solution. So those are, the, those are some things that might come up. Uh, any questions about this stuff yet so far? Is it sort of helping you remember things or just completely destroying you? Everybody's okay? It's going to take a little review for sure. But um, you know, I think we'll I think we'll be okay. All right, let's do some practice problems with our last few minutes here. Oops. Sorry, I usually have this thing able to kind of just beam over, but it's not working today for some reasons. All right, right here. How do I... I'll do this. Can you guys read that? Which of the following pure compounds will exhibit hydrogen bonding? Well, think about it for a minute. And then list the letters of, of your choices, and then we'll talk about it. Why is it important that it says the following pure compounds? Why is that an important distinction, that they're pure compounds? Well, yeah, that's, that's probably true. Um, but in this case, the reason they say pure is because a compound can be a hydrogen bond acceptor, but not a donor. Like, take something like acetone. Let's look at that a second. That's not one of these, is it? No. So take a look at acetone. Acetone has a dipole here, and that oxygen can act as a hydrogen bond receptor, acceptor for something like water or something with hydrogens. So acetone can hydrogen bond with something like water. But if it's pure acetone, it can't hydrogen bond with itself because there's no hydrogen on acetone that's connected to an O, an N, or an F. So you see what why it says that? So that means... If it's a pure substance, it needs one of those hydrogens to donate as well as to be able to accept. So that said, uh, is A, can that hydrogen bond? Yes. It can. How do you know? That's right. The OH on the end uh, has a dipole with hydrogen, hydrogen connected to oxygen, so that can hydrogen bond. That's ethanol. What about B? Why not? Yeah, oxygen is bonded to carbon, not hydrogen. And you have to be a little bit careful. They were nice to you in this question. But remember that in some of these, you really kind of have to draw the Lewis structure to find out because they might have rearranged the um, elements and it's not that clear. But that is B is formaldehyde, and that's true. That one cannot hydrogen bond. Its structure looks like this. It's 
So it can be a hydrogen bond acceptor on that oxygen, but it has no hydrogen to, to donate hydrogen bond. Uh, what about C? No, it's ethylene. D? No, acetylene. Uh, e? No, that's a dimethyl ether. Again, can be a hydrogen bond acceptor, but not a donor. What about S? Yes, because of the NH, the amine, that's methylamine. Uh, G, propane, no. And H? Yes, yes ammonia, for hydrogen bond, for sure. OK, good. Let's look at one other one. Identify the hybridization state and geometry of each carbon atom in the following compounds. Let's just go through and you can you can shout them out. What's this one here? SP. How about this one? How'd you know that, by the way, for those? It's linear? Well, you're assuming they drew it right, but yeah. Right, it just has two things, one on either side. So if it's connected to two things, that means it needs two hybrid orbitals, so it's sp hybridized. Okay. What about here? sp2, right? Three things connected, so you need three hybrid orbitals. And what about this one? And here? And here? And what about this hydrogen? Just s, right? Why can't hydrogen hybridize? Yeah, because its valence orbital is the 1s. There's no p orbitals there, so no hybridization. OK, um, B, how about this one? sp3? Good. What about here? Yeah. What? Okay, so this is a little interesting. This is cyclopropane. It's a ring. Um, what's weird about that compound? Why would you expect that to be particularly stable or particularly unstable? Why? Well, that's true. Um, but there is one one other aspect here. One thing that we know about because we didn't do geometry here. What's the geometry around that carbon? Tetrahedral, right? Right. Bond angle should be about 110. What's the geometry, or what is the angle inside an equilateral triangle? 60, right? 60 degrees. So if that carbon is supposed to have bond angles of 110, and it actually has bond angles of 60, what's happening with those bonds? They're very strained. And this is a good place that models come in. I don't have my kit down here today. But if you try to build this with your models, you'll probably break them. You'll squeeze it, you'll try to get them to connect, and they'll probably snap, or at least bend really badly or something, depending on what kind of model you have. And that's, that's analogous to what happens in, in real life. This, these molecules are, um, I wouldn't say they're like crazily reactive, but they're definitely more reactive than their unstrained counterparts. And we'll talk about some reactions of some um, molecules like this, and you can use that bond strain to do some reactions because it increases the reactivity. Um, okay, so let's stop there, and I will see you upstairs in 15 minutes.